Hello, I finally did it. I added more shit. I said I would like six months ago and I finally did it. Added more greenery. Did it last night. Um, let me know if you like it. I might add some more up here. Wow. But I don't know, maybe the, uh, 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 maybe the asymmetry is nice. I don't know. Let me know. Let me know what you think. Anyway, for thousands of years, people have associated certain animals with bad luck, doom, or even impending death. But why? Today we're going to explore some of the most infamous bad omens. Not the band, but animals. And I'll introduce you to a couple you might have never heard of, but whose reputations have persisted in some cultures for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, I usually say something before we go boom, but that's kind of just it. Let's get to the video. Just for some quick context, this is one of two topics I had my patrons vote on for the spooky specimen season. Obviously last week we had the Save the Elephants video, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. The second spooky specimens topic, which is much more spooky and frankly might be too disturbing for some audiences. So this one's kind of like the warm up of the two. So let's get right into it. We're gonna start off with the poster child of a bad omen. The crow, more broadly the genus Corvus, which also includes your ravens, your rooks. Obviously the focus is on crows and ravens. These are the birds that make you think of a deep, dark fog, black magic perhaps. I don't know, that's what I think of. They're very ominous, and this vibe can be traced back hundreds, if not thousands of years. The bad omen business shows up everywhere. In Western Europe, ravens were believed to be a sign of impending doom, possibly tied to raids of Viking invaders. Celtic legends went even further. Don't worry guys, editor here to be offended by the pronunciation of Celtics on your behalf. Freedom! And described ravens as companions of gods of war like Bran. And so, because they were linked to war, they became linked to death as well. For ravens nearby, bloodshed on the battlefield isn't far behind. Then there's this legend from Cornwall in England that says not to harm a raven because they might be carrying the soul of King Arthur himself. And then also, there's Norse mythology, Odin, the god that represents wisdom, war, and death. He had two ravens. Oh, f I didn't look up how to pronounce those. Hugin, Moonin, as you would expect. Two ravens, Hugin and Moonin, thought and memory would spend all day flying around the world gathering secrets to bring back for their god. Ravens also have cameos in the Bible. That's right, bitches, Noah's Ark. When the world had the big flood, there was a raven that Noah let fly first to find dry land. And it did come back, but not to the Ark, to feed on drowned corpses nearby. The raven was punished for this, which color changed from white to black, and its song from a pretty tune to a guttural croak. Fast forward to medieval times and things get grim. Crows and ravens were the birds most likely to be found pecking at the corpses on battlefields or hanging around plague carts. Not because they brought death, but because, hey, they're opportunists. But people at the time saw it differently. They started calling a group of crows a murder and a group of ravens an unkindness. Quite the PR campaign, and it stuck. During the Black Death, the bird-like, beak mask doctors that haunted the streets literally wore the image of a crow, a symbol of impending doom that today the goth bitches are all over. And I completely understand. That mask is wicked. And then the Tower of London made that superstition a royal order. Legend has it that Charles II ordered ravens to be in the tower to protect it. I guess the idea was that the kingdom would fall if the ravens ever left. And so, to this day, they keep resident ravens there. And this has turned into a very successful breeding program since 1987. But these bad omens didn't say limited to Europe. In India, people believed the house crow was immortal, skipping death again and again. In Russia, hearing a crow caw from a roof was a sign of misfortune. Even in the literature, from Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven, to folk rhymes about counting magpies to protect one's fortune. These bad luck bitches are all over the place. And so, with all this ominous symbolism, who actually are the crows and ravens? First off, sick as fuck. They're in the family Corvidae, which includes crows, ravens, magpies, jays, nutcrackers, even funky looking ratchet tailed tree pods. They're songbirds, yes, but the biggest and most robust of them all. Thick build and common ravens can tower over two feet long with a wingspan close to five feet. That's a bit unsettling, I'll admit. That's like almost as tall as me. That's enough. They're natural omnivores and scavengers, which means they will eat just about anything. Insects, seeds, amphibians, reptiles, eggs, nuts, birds, worms, mosques, mammals, fruits, carrion, even human garbage when living in the city lights. They're found on every continent except Antarctica, in habitats ranging from deep forest to dense city. Easily the coolest thing about them is their intelligence. Corvids are tool users, and not only users, but makers. That's unusual and sick. Some take sticks and not only poke them into holes to fish out insects, but also shape and manipulate those sticks into hooks. That's making a tool 
that's sick as fuck. Then they actually keep the tools and bring them along for future work, sometimes even hiding them from would-be thieves. They've got street smarts too. Pros in Japan figured out that cars can crack walnuts better than their beaks, so they'll drop them at intersections and wait for the lights to turn red before swooping down to grab their lunch. In lab tests, crows solve string-pulling puzzles and even navigate the Aesop's Fable Challenge, where they drop stones into a water-filled tube, then there's a treat in it, so then dropping stones will raise the treat to a height that they can reach. Crows consistently pick up that denser, sinkable, or more useful objects or would get the job done best. That is toddler shit. That is sick. They also have insane memory. Jays bury thousands of acorns to stash food for winter and can remember the locations months later. I bet you can't even do that with your keys. They spread these seeds far and wide and in doing so literally help forests regrow. Because while they can't remember the locations of many, they can't remember the locations of absolutely all. So that unintentional forgetting plants the next generation of trees. They also have insane facial recognition. If you piss a crow off, you are fucked generationally. The whole flock will learn to avoid your face. Even descendants won't fuck with you. They don't mess around. And just like any intelligent animals, they love to play. Ravens have been seen sliding down snowbanks just for the fuck of it. They steal objects, tease dogs, invent games. Some people talk about having relationships with crows in their neighborhoods, leaving gifts for them and the crows bring gifts in return. My friend Haley up in Portland, Angel's partner, has been trying to do this. She leaves gifts out, brings in gifts and stuff, and they're starting to bring back shit to her, like stuff that they would probably build a nest with. So that's pretty cool. And now I'm gonna start doing that because that's very cool. I tried to leave out a blueberry for some crows, but they didn't pick it up because they probably just don't trust me yet. So I gotta figure out what to leave them because I wanna start doing that, see if I get any gifts. So how did they get so clever? Partly their brains, of course. Corvids have more neurons in their forebrains than many mammals. And their brain structure is very convergent with primates. They also have very long childhoods to give them more time to learn with their parents and each other. And they form strong social bonds and can distinguish between good and bad relationships in the community. Crows and ravens are sick, and honestly, their reputation is sick too. Next, the eye eye. Understandably, bone chilling. Objectively, they look like a sewer rat. And across Madagascar, the aye, aye isn't just a curiosity, it's an omen, a bad one. Traditional lore says that an aye, aye crossing your path means disaster, sometimes even death, is on its way. If one points its outrageously long middle finger at you, you're marked for misfortune. Some stories say their presence brings doom to whole villages. These beliefs are so deeply rooted that some communities historically killed them on sight, hoping to ward off the danger they carry. The aye aye's reputation didn't spring from thin air. It's a case study on how unfamiliar freaks feed human superstition. They're an unfortunate case of not living up to societal beauty standards. First, that finger. The aye aye's third digit is unlike any other primates. Bony, long, almost twig-like, and tipped with a claw. Objectively, wretched, you must admit. People saw it as unnatural, even magical, especially when they would use it in this eerie tapping, scanning for hollow wood and listening for insect prey. If you don't know what they're doing, that's creepy as fuck. Add in their big yellow eyes shining in the dark, bat-like ears that swivel independently, and a habit of suddenly appearing around farm plots or villages, especially when forests are scarce. And boom, that's a bad omen. They also have rodent-like front teeth that never stop growing and allows them to gnaw through bark shells, even fucking cinder blocks, dude. Well, this might seem like a New York City rat that found its way into radioactive sludge. The I.I. is perfectly adapted for its niche. They're the largest nocturnal primate on Earth that we know of and the only living member of its family. I didn't look up how to pronounce this, but I'm just gonna go for it. Dabentoniety. We'll see how good that was. Their closest fossil relative, the giant I.I., was at least two and a half times their size. Today, their wild population has dropped by more than half in just 36 years, a plunge fueled by habitat loss and superstition. The I.I.'s biology is even stranger than its curse. It builds intricate, spherical nets high in the canopy, sleeping by day and foraging alone at night. Those infamous hands look alien for a reason. The middle finger, which makes up two thirds of the hand's length, two thirds of the hand's length. That's crazy. It can slip under bark, while the ball and socket joint gives it prehensile finesse. It's used for percussive foraging, tapping on wood, echolocating like a freak, then gouging through to trap fat insects with precision. They have a diet of grubs, fruit, nectar, seeds, and even the occasional egg or coconut if they can get one. Obviously, IIs aren't actually bad omens, and a recent study across 11 villages found that their reputation is shifting. Half the people still held negative attitudes, but more than a third were neutral, and nearly one in five associated IIs with benefits, like pest control for major crops. So that's definitely a step in the right direction. Next, imagine sitting in an old wooden house late at night. Everything is quiet until you hear a slow, steady tapping coming from the walls or the ceiling. In Europe, people used to believe that this noise meant death was near. They called it the Death Watch Beetle. 
Some people thought the tapping was a message from the Grim Reaper himself, but why? When family members were really sick, the rest of the family would keep watch over them, usually in complete silence. And in those quiet moments, you could hear the beetle knocking from inside the wood. The tapping got connected with death, and soon became an omen of bad luck. But the reality of this beetle is quite the opposite of that. So let me start from the beginning. The Death Watch beetle is a tiny brown insect, just five to nine millimeters long. As a little larva, it spends years, sometimes more than a decade, chewing away inside old wood, especially oak. This causes real damage to houses and furniture, mostly in Europe and the UK, where many of the buildings were made of oak. Then. When they finally become legal adults, the famous tapping comes in. The males make noise by banging their heads or jaws on the wood. They do this to call for a mate. If a female hears it and is interested, she'll tap back. It's like a secret Morse code, and it can go on for a while. The sound travels through the wood, not in the air, which is why people hear it best in old, quiet buildings. Scientists learn that male beetles don't waste energy tapping all the time. If they hear a reply, they move toward it. If not, they change spots and try again. And the tap pattern is pretty specific, usually four to 11 knocks in a row, up to 11 taps per second before a break. That's fucking insane. That's like, that's even faster than that. It's like that. Both males and females can tap, but it's the males that usually walk around searching while tapping. Once the beetles find each other, they bang and lay the next generation of eggs deep in the wood and the cycle starts again. When it's time for the larvae to become adults, they chew a small exit hole and leave, sometimes after living hidden for up to 13 years. So yeah, this isn't a tap of impending doom, or a message from the Grim Reaper. No, quite the opposite. This is just a tap dance of some beetles trying to bang. Next. And this next one on the list you might be more familiar with definitely gets talked about online as a sign of impending doom. Or fish, another deep sea fish washing ashore. But for now, we're gonna focus on the or fish, just for a sec. They're often called the doomsday fish. And in Japanese folklore, seeing one is a sign that a natural disaster, like an earthquake, might be on the way. Why? Well, obviously or fish and other deep sea fish are super rare to see, deep sea. So we know sea. <laughs> Okay, warfish usually live like 50 to 3,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. When one washes up, or worse, several in a short time, locals start worrying something is wrong underwater or with the planet in general. It doesn't help that they're pretty godforsaken to look at. The longest warfish ever recorded was about 26 feet long, but there's reports of even longer ones like 56 feet, which is sick, as in s disgusting and sick. Not disgusting, that's mean, just not pleasant. But we don't know for sure, because none have ever been recorded that long, but they've been apparently seen. But, you know, you know how that shit goes. Anyway, they're skinny and flat like a ribbon, with a body covered in shimmering scales and a bright red, spiky fin that runs all the way down their back. And because of that, they're actually sometimes called the king of herrings. I've never heard that myself, but that's what it said. People used to think they could lead schools of herring, but that they were the original inspiration for sea serpents in old sailor stories, which that makes sense. This looks like shit that could swallow you whole, but that is not the case. Or fish are filter feeders, drifting around, looking for krill and plankton. Sometimes you'll see pictures of an or fish with what looks like a stump at their tail end. That's because they can fucking self amputate. Scientists aren't exactly sure why, but it could help them survive on less food, since large tails are harder to maintain in the deep. So why do or fish turn up on beaches if they live so far below? The simple answer is something goes wrong for them not for the world. Orfish aren't very strong swimmers, so if they get pushed up by storms, big waves, or even ocean currents, it's hard for them to get back. They usually appear at the surface because they're sick, injured, or dying. It could also be due to changes in weather, currents, or other water events that push multiple orfish toward the surface. Probably what led this legend that got even more heightened after the earthquake in Japan back in 2011. Then in recent years, there have been some deep sea fish that have come up on the California coast, like that football fish in Newport Beach, and immediately people thought it was a bad omen, a sign of something no good. But seeing an orfish or other deep sea fish on the sand is surprising, unpleasant, but not a sign of doom. It's just Shit happens sometimes, you know? Things happen and then that's it. So, next. Well, not next, last, but definitely not least. Owls. Owls are sick looking. Another mascot for the witchy community. So as you would expect, riddled with superstition. The reputation goes much deeper than the Tootsie Pop commercials. People associate owls with bad omens, death, and the supernatural all over the world and have done so for thousands of years. In ancient Rome, seeing or hearing an owl was considered so ominous and godforsaken that the city would sometimes perform rituals to ward off evil after a sighting. One sighting, whole city, disaster, psychologically. Owls were monsters of the night, 
and their cries in the dark were believed to predict death, illness, or disaster. Some English traditions called the barn owl a bird of doom. If its eerie screech passed a sick person's window, death was thought to be near. In Kenya, the Kikuyu believe an owl's call was a sign someone would die soon. In North America, many native cultures warned kids to behave, or owls would come and snatch them up. Others interpreted an owl sighting or even just an owl hoot as a call of death or a visit from the spirits of the dead. The Aztecs and Maya even carved owls as symbols for death gods. Inuit legends said owls would carry souls to the afterlife. Chinese tradition warned that an owl's call meant impending doom. So what's really the story? What's actually going on here? I think it's safe to say that all this ominous vibe comes from the fact that owls are night hunters. They're out at night. You hear them at night. Already spooky. And then the fucking eyes. Forward facing, very large, and glow in the dark due to some retinal shit. For them, insane night and depth perception for us makes them more spooky. And they can't rotate their eyes, so instead, owls rotate their heads and can go like 270 degrees on account of 14 neck vertebrae, double what we have, and special blood vessels to keep their brain supplied while they spin their heads around. Very sick, but at night, very unsettling. Owls are a massive group, about 250 species, and found on every continent except Antarctica. They show up in deserts, rainforests, mountains, you name it. Silent flight is another owl trademark. Their feathers have comb-like edges that break up air and let them sneak up on prey without a sound. This ghostly silence is the stuff of legends. Probably helps feed all those scary stories. Owls come in all sizes. The tiny elf owl is barely bigger than a golf ball. Objectively very cute. And then there's the massive Blackiston's fish owl that can weigh 10 pounds and have a wingspan of over six feet. Objectively very heinous. One thing they all have in common, a diet of meat. From insects and earthworms to mice, frogs, fish, even other birds. Owls are ruthless predators, but they don't eat humans and they don't eat our souls or do anything with our souls that we know of. <laughs> anyway, so that's that. That's the bad omens animals that I have for today. Thanks again to my patrons for voting for this topic because it was very fun to research. And yeah, sign up for Patreon if you want to vote on upcoming video topics because we do that shit. So, and if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next Spooky Specimens episode. But before that, the second episode of The Evolution of Us, that we know of. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya! <laughs>